Why are our boys and our black children more at risk? Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons that you can potentially point a finger to um, from, from, from the research. We know that boys tend to be more susceptible to stressors, at least in terms of outward expression of, 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 of acting out behaviors. We know this from fraternal twin studies, boys and girls from the same womb, uh, raised in the same family, same community, experiencing very similar stressors. And when you correlate the stress with the outward expression of behavioral problems, boys tend to show more symptoms of the stress than the girls do. My guess is, is that the girls are showing it too. They're just showing it maybe in, in different ways. Um, children of color oftentimes have more stressors in their life simply because children of color are, are more likely to be living in homes and communities where there are more stressors ever present around them. And so those children absorb that and then they bring it to school and also just the stress of racism and the stress of a lot of other stuff that they have to then carry with them starting at a really young age. We also know that our children of color often attend programs that are of poorer quality and have fewer resources in them. They're less likely, with the exception of Head Start, to get into any pre-K program or preschool program at all. And if they do, they're more likely to get into a program that's of unknown quality because it's an under-the-radar program. It's a program that we, that, that we don't, it's unlicensed, so we don't know anything about the level of quality. Or if we do know something about the quality, we know that it's, it's not the same level of quality as what their, on average, more affluent white peers are attending. But even when you add all of that together, it just didn't seem to be enough to account for the amount of racial and gender disparity that we were finding in this issue of preschool expulsion and suspension. So, we decided to look a little bit deeper in terms of what else could potentially account for this. And is it possible that implicit biases could play some kind of a role in disproportionate expulsion and suspensions in preschool programs? We know that black boys are more likely to be suspended or expelled in elementary school, middle school, high school than white children, even when the behavioral infraction is very similar. Russell Skiba of um, Indiana University did this study where he took behavioral records from elementary school, middle school, high schools. And in those behavioral records, he knew about the child and the age of the child and the race of the child and the gender of the child, and then had a full description of what the child's behavior was, what happened, and then knew what resulted in that. Sent to the principal's office, in school detention, out of school, suspension, expulsion, whatever. And so what they did was they, they, they masked everything except for the description of the behavior and then had teachers rate how severe that behavior was. And then they unmasked the rest of it for data analysis and found that even when you match for the same level of severity of the behavior problem, the black child's more likely to be sent to the principal's office than the white child, more likely to be expelled, more likely to be suspended, a whole host of other types of things. That's what they had found there. Uh, biases about black boys, uh, Goff, interesting study, what Goff did was, was wrote some vignettes about a child who may or may not have done the bad deed, may or may not have, have, have broken the vase, may or may not have lost the ball, may or may not have, you know, whatever, and then, and then asked people to rate, how likely do you think the child did it? How guilty is the child? How culpable is the child? And then, unbeknownst to the people participating in it, he randomized pictures of children to go with the story. Everybody got the same exact story but they randomized different pictures, either of white children or black children, boys or girls. And whenever they put a picture of a black boy with the story, the likelihood of guilt rating went up. It's the same story. All the details are the same. But if a picture of a black boy is put with it, then the child is seen as more guilty. And at the end of the study, the pictures were all of children 10 to 17 years old. At the end of the study, they asked the participants to guess how old the children were. And the black children's ages were overestimated by about four and a half years on average. And that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, that's like half a lifetime if you're 10. You know, if you were to do that with me, that, that, that makes me quite older. <laughs> so, so that's what they found. Oh, the door study, you'll find this one interesting. Five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds. Brought them into the lab, taught the children how to rate pain. You know, if you bit your tongue, how much would it hurt if you stubbed your toe? How much would it hurt if you hit your head? How much would it hurt? And then they showed them pictures of children, some boys, some girls, some black, some white, and they said, he bit his tongue. How much did it hurt? And she stubbed her toe. How much did it hurt? 
And what they found was that at five years old, no real differences. But by the time the children were seven years old, any time a picture of a black boy was shown, the child was perceived by the child looking at it as feeling less pain than the other children and less pain than the child thought he or she would experience. And when you think about this, and, and by the time the children were 10 years old, it was very strong finding. And, and when you think about it, it's really not a study about pain at all, is it? It's a study about something else. It's a study about, it's a study about empathy. You know, remember we once had a president who used to say, I feel your pain. Remember that? I'm dating myself again. You know, but, but that's what empathy basically is. It's the capacity to feel or imagine somebody else's feelings and feel their pain, you know? And what we're basically finding in that study was by the time the children were seven years old, they were feeling other people's pains, but some people not as much, you know? As if I only had a finite amount of empathy and I'm gonna withhold it for some so that I can have it for, for others. And, and there's a lot of things we need to know about our early childhood workforce, but one thing I know for a fact is this. All of our preschool teachers are older than seven. Every one of them. Shifting standards. You'll, you'll, you'll enjoy this one. Shifting standards, it's a hard one for me to describe, but I can give an example of it. But you'd all have to participate. So pretend that you are at a co-educational softball game, OK? Boys, girls participating, and you're the audience. And, and, and it comes time for, for a batter to come up, and a boy comes up to the plate, and he gets ready with the bat, and then the pitch comes in, and he gets a standard base hit and runs to first base. And everybody politely applauds, right? And then up to bat comes next, a girl. And she comes up to bat, and she's getting ready. And the pitch comes in, and standard base hit, and she runs to first base just like the boy. And everybody jumps up out of their seats in a big <laughs> roaring ovation. And tears are flowing, and the music comes up really, you know, just like in the movies, you know. And it may feel like we're being kind to the girl, but in fact what we're doing is we're showing an underlying stereotype bias. That the boy did exactly what we expected him to do, and the girl did not. She violated expectations, in this case in a positive way, and sometimes, you know, it happens in a negative way, but, in, but what we're actually showing is that there was a violation of, of stereotype expectations, and of course the only thing that has to happen in order for that to be the true is we have to have an underlying stereotype set of expectations. And so that's what is basically finding. Now Harbor did this study that he asked um, middle school English teachers, all of them white, to grade an essay. And it was supposed to be a poorly written essay designed to look like C minus, D plus kind of work. And grade the essay, mark it up, and then give it a letter grade. And unbeknownst to the teachers, they, they randomized, everybody got the same essay, but they got a different name at the top to either imply a white child or a black child or a Latina child. And bear in mind, these were poorly written essays, and their job was to give it a letter grade. What they didn't know was that really what they were interested in is when you see that name at the top, does that affect the grade you give to it? When everybody's getting the same essay, thank you. Everybody's getting the same essay. And so what they found, well, first off, why don't you guess? What do you think they found? <laughs> Who got the highest grades? Uh, so I'm hearing all kinds of things. Now, if you said the white child did, that makes a lot of sense, and I can understand why you'd say that. But, but then that means that you haven't, you haven't remembered what I said about shifting standards. So who got the highest letter grades by far, really truly by far, was the, were the black and Latino children? Because it was the poorly written essay. And when the teachers read the essay, you know, this doesn't look all that bad for a black kid. Or you know, this doesn't look all that bad for for a Latina, or, you know, I would have thought Emily would have done better. You know, that's, that's what they were basically finding in that study. And that's basically a study of the way in which our underlying stereotype biases may affect their, our day-to-day -day interactions. Now, that's the kind of way in which the biases work if it's a, it's a, it's a non-zero sum kind of an appraisal. Where everybody can get a high grade, or everybody can get a low grade, or everybody can get praise, or everybody can, 
But when it becomes a zero sum, like there's only so many spots in the AP class, or there's only so many spots in the gifted and talented, then the nature of bias tends to reverse. And can you imagine the whiplash of that? Some people say yeah, and some, some people say yeah, like they've, they really can imagine it. You know, and so it's, it's something certainly to, to wrap your head around. We, um, we knew that there was no study like this in preschool. And so we decided, well, why, not, why don't we try to do a study like this in preschool? And so we decided that we would do a study of implicit bias and how that might affect the way in which teachers view challenging behaviors in preschool programs. We tried to find somebody willing to fund it, and it took us a long time to find somebody who was willing to touch a topic like that. Eventually, uh, we, we found out that W.K. Kellogg would be interested in something like this, the Kellogg Foundation. And so they began funding us at the beginning of 2015. And so please, please, please eat cereal. <laughs> Lots and lots of cereal. Any cereal you find, just, just, just please eat it. Um, we collected the data in November 2015, released the report at a federal meeting. Uh, participants, 123 teachers, all preschool teachers, people who worked in preschool programs, most all of them women. Lots of different types of preschool programs that were represented in the sample. Uh, most of the teachers had worked in the program for, for several years. First part of the study was a video a video of children in a classroom that were doing typical classroom kinds of things. And the job of the teacher was to watch the video and, and, and look for challenging behaviors. And the teachers also were told that there's an eye tracker attached to the screen that can track exactly down to the pixel and the millisecond exactly where they're looking at the screen at any given moment. And so they were given these videos, and they were given these instructions. They had headphones on. And it says, now you're ready to view a series of video clips lasting six minutes. We're interested in learning about how teachers detect challenging behavior in the classroom. Sometimes this involves seeing behavior before it becomes problematic. The video segments you're about to view are of preschoolers engaging in various activities. Some clips may or may not contain challenging behaviors. Your job is to press the enter key on the external keypad every time you see a behavior that could become a potential challenge. And then we showed them how to do that. Uh, please press the keypad as often as needed. That's what we told them. What we didn't tell them is this. There are no challenging behaviors in any of these video clips because they are all child actors that are around a small round table doing Play-Doh work and things that might be typical in a classroom. And there's going to be classroom sounds that you're going to be hearing, but there's nobody else actually in the room. And the reason that the sounds got in there is because we purchased from Amazon a track called Typical Preschool Sounds. <laughs> and because you can buy anything at Amazon. <laughs> and, and we inserted it in there just to make it more lifelike. But the children in the videos were gender and racial balance. We had a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. And what we were really interested in is, is not how quickly you can find behavior problems, because there aren't any. But rather, when we lead you to believe that somebody might misbehave and your job is to find the misbehavior, who do you look at? Who do you look at the most? Who do you keep going back to? When you don't find a misbehavior, who do you go back to again just in case you miss something? Because I knew you had to be doing something. You know, it's kind of the equivalent of a, of, of a mall cop study. You know, if you're a mall security guard, who do you follow in the mall? You know, and in this case, if you're a preschool teacher, you know, who, who do you follow with your eyes? Do you get the sense of what it was that we were doing? So let me show you a bit. You want to see one of the video clips and see what it looks like? This is 15 seconds of what the teacher saw. Again, again, the teacher saw six minutes of this with different camera angles from different perspectives in order to balance what it was that they were seeing. behavior? <laughs> no, they, the teachers didn't either. I'm going to show you here what it basically looked like to do the study. We staged it again after we did the study. We came back to Yale. We went to our local preschool program. And then we asked the, some teachers there to participate in the study in order for us to be able to get them on film, talking about it later, and also to be able to film what the study actually looks like so we could show it to people like you. So this shows a teacher on the left. 
who's watching the video. There's another teacher who's watching the video on a screen. And this black bar right there is the eye tracker. See it? And that's Maria, our research assistant, looking at her screen. And you see the little yellow dot? That's where that teacher's eyes are. And that's how it works. So, the most complicated part of it, or at least the most tedious part of it, is you have to go and outline children frame by frame in order to be able to indicate where the children were. We knew that children, preschool children, moved around a lot, but if you really want to know, you know, outline them frame by frame in a movie. <laughs> you know, that's, that'll give you a sense of it. Children, and then ask them, which child do you think required the most of your attention? And we tracked their eyes then, too. And then the screen went blank, and then we asked them to put the letter of the child you think required the most of your attention. Now, we didn't need to ask the teachers who they looked at the most. We know, we don't, we know down to the millisecond where they were looking, you know. So what we were really interested in is this, three different questions when you think about it. The first one is, when you think a child's going to misbehave, where do you look? And then this part, and are you aware of it? And then when the screen goes blank and you have to enter the letter, and are you willing to admit it? That's what we were basically looking at. Where's the bias? Are you aware of the bias? And will you state the bias? So are you interested in hearing what it was that we found? Okay, so lots of different ways to visualize data like this. This is a spotlight analysis. The lighter the area at that particular moment and frame, the more attention that was being placed there. This is a pinpoint analysis. Every one of these little dots is a teacher's eyes at that particular moment in that particular frame. So you can see exactly where they are, and that allows us to be able to do quantitative analysis of it. And what we basically found was that, was that teachers spent, when they were expecting a child to misbehave, spent significantly more time looking at black children, especially the black boy. And that was true <coughs> across all the teachers in the sample, and that was true for the white teachers, and that was true for the black teachers because it, 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 it seemed to be fairly universal. The bias and the expectation that a black child, and especially the black boy, is going to be the one to misbehave seemed to be one that pretty much all the teachers, no matter how we divided the group, shared. Now, at the end, when we asked them who they thought they were looking at, overwhelmingly, they reported they spent more time looking at boys, especially the black boy. Either way, the black boy is coming out on the short end of the stick. But what we basically found was that the underlying bias looks like a race bias, especially the black boy, though. But the teachers feel that they're actually exhibiting a gender bias, but especially the black boy. <laughs> you know, and so, so that's, that's basically how it, how it seemed to be working out for us. There was a second part of the study. And in the second part of the study, we gave teachers a description of a child with very challenging behaviors, kind of like the poorly written essay study that I told you about before. And in this vignette, in this story, the child was kidding, hitting other kids, scratching other kids, kicking other kids, sometimes leaves marks, sometimes leaves bruises, sometimes hits the teacher, um, doesn't do what the child is asked to do, does a lot of other types of inappropriate things. Pretend like the child is in your classroom, rate how severe the behavior problem is, but we altered the story and randomized the name that was given to the child to either be Deshaun, Latoya, Jake, or Emily. And the way in which you come up with these kind of names is we were doing the study in, in, in 2016, 2015, 2015. We were doing the study. So you go back in time four years before then and look at US Census birth records and then find a name that's very, very, very common within one group, but almost unheard of outside of that group. And that becomes a stereotype name. And these names get recycled into a lot of studies like this. So those were the names that we used. The, the more interesting part of the study was this, though. Teachers were randomized also to either get or not get a second paragraph. The second paragraph described the child's home life. 
in terms that could maybe help the teacher relate to the child or understand why this child might behave, be behaving this way. Uh, we said that the child lives at home uh, with mom. Mom works three jobs to try to make ends meet. They're all poor paying jobs with unusual hours. Uh, she's still not doing too well in terms of making ends meeting and paying the bills. We, we think she might be depressed, but she doesn't seem to have the means to be able to get treatment for it. We don't know much about dad, uh, but when dad is around, mom and dad tend to fight a lot. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes the child sees it. And so the basic idea behind this was, was this. If the teacher knows this information, is it possible that just having an understanding of why the child might be missing? be behaving like this, or having some way to feel empathic to the child and the child's family, could that be a potential partial cure for bias? Could we see bias, and is it possible that the more we know about the family, the less we dehumanize them, and the more we can relate to them? Is it possible that empathy is one of the cures for bias? Because I've been going around giving talks like this and saying things like, like one thing that I can tell you that I've never seen or heard of is this. A child, and it's true, I've never seen or heard of a child who was expelled or suspended from a preschool program when the teacher and the parent knew and liked each other. Like, I don't, you don't see that typically, you know? So is it possible that just having some kind of a connection creates some kind of a protective factor, you know, that can overcome the other ones? And so we were curious in testing this out. And what we basically found was that it, it's, it, it did work. The second paragraph did work, but only kind of. It only worked in certain instances. It only worked when the teacher was of the same race that she thought the child was. If the teacher was of the same race that she thought the child was, having the second paragraph made the behavior problem seem not quite so bad after all. Maybe I can work with this. But if the teacher was of a different race than what she thought the child was, getting the second paragraph didn't just not work. It actually made the problem seem worse. And that really wasn't what we wanted to, to find out, because I, I really wanted a more simplistic answer of all we need to do is make a better, can help our teachers understand the more about the lives of these children. But we're left with, with this understanding, or at least this direction to our current thinking around this, is that that's not enough if the teacher doesn't have some sense of shared cultural understanding of what that information means. And if they, if they can relate to it, that's great, and it helps. But if they can't relate to it, then it might actually just further support the stereotype bias. Because not only do those children behave that way, so do their parents. You know, and so it's, it's, it's a trickier thing than what we had wanted it to be. Um, we, when we first released this, we, we, we started working with media to do a full media rollout on this, including working with NPR. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the NPR piece on it. I don't have time to play it for you, uh, but if you want to go and just Google NPR, Bias, Walter Gilliam, Yale, you'll, you'll, you'll find it pretty easy. It's a nice four and a half minute treatment of this topic. And one of the things that they highlighted at the end of it, which is something that I like to mention in presentations, uh, is, is that one of the findings that we found that I liked the most from this study is, is this. We actually had to, to fib to the teachers. We told them things that weren't really true. And so at the end of the study, when you do that, you need to come clean and tell the teachers what, what really happened and give them the opportunity to withdraw their data. Now, that is the scariest moment any researcher, because you're spending a lot of money here. You know, it's, it's OPM, it's other people's money, you know, but you, it's still you get a lot of money to do a study like this. You never heard the phrase OPM? <laughs> so you're spending this money, you're doing this study, and, and it's possible that everybody could just pull out. At the, and, then, and then you don't have any findings. But out of 135 teachers who participated in the study, when we contacted them after the study was over and said, no, this was not a study to see how fast you could find behavior problems. This was a study about biases, yours. We had, out of 135, one teacher say, please withdraw my data. That's great, isn't it? Because what it tells me is this. What it tells me is, in the early childhood field at least, we we seem to have teachers who care more about their babies than they care about their egos. And when you got that, you could work with that. That's a positive thing. That's a, that's a tremendous thing. That's probably my favorite 
finding in the whole study. Let me show you really quickly what happened when we had teachers go through the study and then ask them questions at the end about well, which child did you follow the most? Which child did you think you saw the most or needed to see the most? And then we asked them questions like, or we told them, well, what if I told you all the children were child actors? Now why do you think you follow the black boy the most? You know, this is what they had to say in a two-minute montage. There was one particular child that stood out who was playing Play-Doh, um, and each time he was just grabbing instead of using his words or asking for turns. Um, really just, I could foresee that being a problem with the other children eventually. In my head while I was watching, it was like, oh, maybe the teacher said, oh, you know, he can just stay over here because if I say you need to go to a different area, then he might, like, throw a chair or flip out. So they said, oh, you can just stay at this table. Boys are more active. Girls are acclimated. Like, girls like to sit in the kitchen or dramatic play and rock the babies and be helpful. Um, whereas boys at three, four, and five, like that rough and tough and tumble, and while in a classroom you can't do rough and tumble, so the boys tend to get called out more than the girls. I would say, you know, that situation with those kids, you know, taking away the toys, you know, who's to say, you know, later on down the road, a couple months from now, he's going to start getting aggressive if the kids don't give him his toys back or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Like if you were to take the Play-Doh and the kid doesn't want to give it back, so what happens if he becomes aggressive because he's not getting his way anymore? If you know a family that had similar struggles as you, then you might be able to relate to them more. But if you don't, then you might just blame it on their race or something different and just say, oh. Well, think about our society. They fear black men, so boys get labeled, especially young black boys. Um, and they learn that at a young age, and they grow up with that, and it follows through all their schooling. So as you can listen to this, I mean, the teachers had very rich thoughts in their mind, right. and in some cases, they, yes, have you ever read the, the, the book, If You Give the Mouse a Cookie, then they'll probably want milk, then this will happen, this will happen, you know, very rich stories about all these things that are going to happen, you know, I have to put this child in a special place, because if I don't, then this will happen, and this will happen, and then, you know, the police will come, and then, you know, blah, 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 you know, and, and, and it's great that they have rich story. It's great for all of us to have rich representations in our mind of children, but if we don't hold in check or at least understand what those representations mean and where they come from, it's some, sometimes the, the stories can take some pretty twisted turns. See, that may not necessarily be in the best interest of children. Biases are normal. We all have, there, everybody in this room has biases. If you go to a fresh fruit market stand and you get the fruit and it tastes great and so much fresher than what you can get at Stop and Shop, and then the next time you go to Stop and Shop, you think, oh, I don't want to buy the apples here. I can get fresher apples at the fresh fruit market stand. That's a bias. That's now a bias about fresh fruit market stands and about Stop and Shop. The only difference is, is, that, is that you won't ruin an apple's life. <laughs> you know, and, but when you're talking about children, you know, I mean, then it, it, it takes on completely different proportions, you know, and so, you know, we all have them. It's really just an, an, an issue, I think, of understanding where they come from and understanding that they're in us in order to make sure that we can have some degree of control and understanding of our biases rather than our biases having all the control of us. Uh, the way in which biases are formed is we take things that we heard or think we've heard or seen or think we've seen and then create sweeping generalizations about people in our head. That's, that's how you create a stereotype bias. But the way in which it hurts children is when the data flow goes in the other direction. And because I feel this way or think this is true about a group of people, the next time I see a child who looks like or reminds me of that group, it's going to be true for him too. That's the way in which it harms children because we're then pigeonholing children into these preconceived notions that are in our head. And I worry that some of the times when we talk about these issues with teachers and professional development, we may tell them things about cultural groups, but we don't tell them about the mechanics of how this actually happens in their heads. You know, and if you don't know how the bomb is wired, you can't defuse the bomb without it going off in your head. And I do worry sometimes that the way in which we've tried to address this in the past really just has fallen pretty short of the mark of actually being helpful 
for teachers or families. So why do I care so much about disparities and expulsion and suspension? A lot of people in the early childhood field have, have, um, have heard about these studies, studies like the Perry Preschool Study. Have you heard of the Perry Preschool Study? The early childhood people might have heard about it. Uh, or the Abyssidarian Study in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or the Chicago Child Parent Centers. The reason why these studies are very famous is because they are really the three studies, pretty much the only three studies that we use to make the case for the importance of preschool programs and early childhood programs because they're long-term longitudinal studies that allow us to say things like, because they started back in the 60s, randomizing children to the preschool program or not go to the preschool program. The children who went to the preschool program, less likely to need special ed, that costs money, less likely to be retained in, uh, in, in their grade level in elementary school, middle school, high school, that costs money. They were more likely to be employed more likely to pay more in taxes, that makes money for the government, less likely to be incarcerated, that saves money. All of these kind of things that allow us to be able to say things like every dollar that goes into early care and education yields back $7.14 in societal savings by the time the children are 27 years old. That's a strong return on investment. Or $17 by the time the children are, 20, are 45 years old. It's because of these studies that we have the proliferation of pretty much all of our early care and education programs. But what a lot of people don't know about these studies is this. The Perry Preschool Study, the most commonly cited study in the field of early care and education, 123 children in Ypsilanti, Michigan, every one of them were black. Every single child in the study was black. The Abyssidarian Study in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the second most cited, 98% black. The Chicago Child Parent Centers, the number three most cited, 93% black. What we've done in this country is taken data that belonged to our black children, black families, black communities, used it to create a program for all of our children, and then when no one's paying attention, we kick out the back door of the kids who gave us the data in the first place. I'm the country for a long time now, 20 years, talking about these three studies over and over again. But I've I've decided a few years ago that I'm no longer going to, even though I need to, to make the case for investing in young children. I'm no longer going to talk about Perry. I'm no longer going to talk about Abyssidary, and I'm no longer going to talk about the Chicago Child Parent Centers, unless I'm able and willing to spend at least an equal amount of my time and energy to protect the rights of the children who gave us the data in the first place. Because they're not, they're not our data. They're not our data. They belong to those children and those families. And it happens all the time. I mean, we have a long history of this in the United States, doing medical research in communities of color, knowing full well that they'll be the last to see this innovation. You know, and it happens all the time. But it should never happen in early childhood, not in a field that is based in social justice and based in these issues. You know, when you think about Head Start, Head Start began during the War on Poverty and was first located in the Office of Economic Opportunity not in the Administration for Children and Families, because it didn't exist at the time. The Office of Economic Opportunity. It was seen as an agent of social justice, but until we can get ahead of this kind of an issue, then it does not become an agent, and it is not an agent of social justice. It just becomes a place for social justice ills to rear its head yet again. You know, and so we have to get ahead of this in order to make sure that our remedies are actually indeed remedies. Social justice and civil rights are often matters of access about getting into something. And that can be access to a seat on the bus, or it can mean access to a seat at a deli counter, or a voting poll, or a higher education, or an elementary school. And in the case that we're talking about right now, we're talking about access to early care and education programs. But access is not just about getting in the front door, it's about making sure you're not pushed out the back door too. You know, and so that's why I think it's important for us to be thinking about these issues in part because it protects our return on investment, but also because it's just unconscionable for us to use data that belong to a group of children and then disenfranchise them from the program their data purchased. You know, and that's why I care about this. I'm not naive enough to believe that all of our children in life are gonna hit a home run, but I do think that they all deserve a chance at the plate with a decent bat and a fairly pitched ball. And that's the whole idea behind early care and education. And that's what we're attempting to do. So I'm going to leave right now with just, just telling you that we're moving forward with some of this stuff. We're trying to come up with new ways of, to think about professional development that feeds teachers' heads but also feeds their hearts. Um, and also thinking about ways to better measure equity in classrooms and better measure 
teacher-child interactions in very small, minute ways, because we don't do a good enough job of that. Most of our measures that we have right now that measure how teachers interact with classrooms are mostly measures that measure how the teacher interacts with the majority of the children. And as long as the measure is purposefully looking at how the teacher interacts with the majority of the children, it is by design missing issues of equity. Because equity is not how you interact with the majority of the children. It's how you interact with even the minority of the children and every single individual children in relationship to all the other children in the classroom. So we're trying to work on those kind of technologies. I used to believe that in education, we measure the things that we value. And then I've since come to understand, nope, it is truly the opposite. We just value whatever we measure. And if I can change the measurements, if we can change the measurements, if we can change the measurement tools, then sometimes we can affect human behavior without the humans even really thinking about it. Because we've Trojan horsed it into the system that way. So that's some of the directions that we're working on. If you want to read more about this, please go to www.zieglercenter.yale.edu and you can read more about the research or follow me on Twitter at Walter Gilliam. I, I recently learned how to do that. At Walter Gilliam and I tweet these kind of things out. Thank you so much for your kind attention.